Recording by Phil Chenevere. The K Factor by Harry Harrison, Section 1. We're losing a planet, Neil. I'm afraid that I can't understand it. The bald and wrinkled head wobbled a bit on the thin neck, and his eyes were moist. Abra Vanell was a very old man. Looking at him, Neil realized for the first time just how old and close to death he was. It was a profoundly shocking thought. "'Pardon me, sir,' Neil broke in, "'but is it possible to lose a planet, I mean, if the readings are done correctly and the K-factor equations work to the tenth decimal place, then it's really just a matter of adjustment, making the indicated corrections. After all, societics is an exact science.' "'Exact! Exact! Of course it's not! Have I taught you so little that you dare say that to me?' Anger animated the old man, driving the shadow of death back a step or two. Neil hesitated, feeling his hands quiver ever so slightly, groping for the right words. Societics was his faith, and his teacher, Abravanel its only prophet. This man before him, carefully preserved by the age-retarding drugs, was unique in the galaxy, a living anachronism, a refugee from the history books. Abra Vanell had single-handedly worked out the equations, spelled out his science of societics. Then he had trained seven generations of students in its fundamentals. Hearing the article of his faith, defamed by its creator, produced a negative feedback loop in Neil so strong his hands vibrated in tune with it. It took a jarring effort to crack out of the cycle. The laws that control societics, as postulated by you, are as exact as any others in the unified field theory universe. No, they're not. And if any man I taught believes that nonsense, I'm retiring tomorrow and dropping dead the day after. My science, and it is really not logical to call it a science, is based on observation, experimentation, control groups, and corrected observations. And though we have made observations in the millions, we are dealing in units in the billions, and the interactions of these units are multiples of that. And let us never forget that our units are people who, when they operate as individuals, do so in a completely different manner. So you cannot truthfully call my theories exact. They fit the facts well enough, and produce results in practice that, has been empirically proven, so far. Some day, I am sure, we will run across a culture that doesn't fit my rules. At that time the rules will have to be revised. We may have that situation now on Himmel. There's trouble cooking there. They have always had a high activity count, sir, Neil put in hopefully. High, yes, but always negative, until now. Now it is slightly positive, and nothing we can do seems to change it. That's why I've called you in. I want you to run a new basic survey, ignoring the old one still in operation, to re-examine the checkpoints on our graphs. The trouble may lie there." Neil thought before he answered, picking his words carefully. "'Wouldn't that be a little unethical, sir? After all, Hingley, who is operator there now, is a friend of mine. Going behind his back, you know. I know nothing of the sort, Abravanel snorted. We are not playing for poker chips or seeing who can get a paper published first. Have you forgotten what societics is? Neil answered by rote. The applied study of the interaction of individuals in a culture, the interaction of the group generated by these individuals, the equations derived therefrom, and the application of these equations to control one or more factors of this same culture. And what is the one factor that we have tried to control in order to make all the other factors possible of existence? War, Neil said in a very small voice. Very good, then. There is no doubt what it is we are talking about. You are going to land quietly on Himmel, do a survey as quickly as possible, and transmit the data back here. There is no cause to think of it as sneaking behind Hangley's back, but as doing something to help him set the matter right. Is that understood? Yes, sir, Neil said firmly this time, straightening his back and letting his right hand rest reassuringly on the computer slung from his belt. 
Excellent. Then it is now time to meet your assistant. Abravanel touched a button on his desk. It was an unexpected development, and Neil waited with interest as the door opened. But he turned away abruptly, his eyes slitted and his face white with anger. Abravanel introduced them. Neil Sidorak, this is Costa. I know him. He was in my class for six months. There wasn't the slightest touch of friendliness in Neil's voice now. Abravanel either ignored it or didn't hear it. He went on as if the two cold, distant young men were the best of friends. Classmates, very good. Then there is no need to make introductions, though it might be best to make clear your separate areas of control. This is your project, Neil, and Adao Costa will be your assistant, following your orders and doing whatever he can to help. You know he isn't a graduate societist, but he has done a lot of field work for us and can help you greatly in that. And, of course, he will be acting as an observer for the U.N. and making his own reports in this connection. Neil's anger was hot and apparent. So he's a U.N. observer now. I wonder if he still holds his old job at the same time. I think it only fair, sir, that you know he works for Interpol. Abravanel's ancient and weary eyes looked at both men, and he sighed. Wait outside, Costa, he said. Neil will be with you in a minute. Costa left without a word, and Abravanel waved Neil back to his chair. Listen to me now, he said, and stop playing tunes on that infernal buzzer. Neil snapped his hand away from the belt computer, as if it had suddenly grown hot. A resistant finger reached out to clear the figures he had nervously been setting up, then thought better of it. Abravanel sucked life into his ancient pipe and squinted at the younger man. Listen, he said, you have led a very sheltered life here at the university, and that is probably my fault. No, don't look angry. I don't mean about girls. In that matter, undergraduates have been the same for centuries. I'm talking about people in groups, individuals, politics, and all the complicated mess that makes up human life. This has been your area of study, and the program is carefully planned so you can study it second-hand. The important thing is to develop the abstract viewpoint, since any attempt to prejudice results can only mean disaster, and it has been proved many times that a man with a certain interest will make many unwitting errors to shape an observation or experiment in favor of his interest. No, we could have none of that here. We are following the proper study of mankind, and we must do that by keeping personally on the outside to preserve our perspective. When you understand that, you understand many small things about the university. Why we only give resident students scholarships at a young age, and why the out-of-the-way location here in the Dolomites. You will also see the reason why the campus bookstore stocks all of the books published but never has an adequate supply of newspapers. The agreed policy has been to see that you all mature with a long view. Then, hopefully, you will be immune to short-term political interests after you leave. This policy has worked well in turning out men with the correct attitude towards their work. It has also turned out a fair number of self-centered, egocentric horrors. Neil flushed. Do you mean that I... No, I don't mean you. If I did, I would say so. Your worst fault, if you can call it a fault, since it is the very thing we have been trying to bring about, is that you have a very provincial attitude towards the universe. Now is the time to re-examine some of those ideas. First, what do you think the attitude of the UN is toward the societics? There was no easy answer. Neil could see traps ready for anything he said. His words were hesitant. I can't say I've really ever thought about it. I imagine the U.N. would be in favor of it, since we make their job of world government that much easier. No such thing, Abravanel said, tempering the sharpness of his words with a smile. To put it in the simplest language, they hate our guts. They wish I had never formulated societics, and at the same time they are very glad I did. They are in the position of the man who caught the tiger by the tail. The man enjoys watching the tiger eat all of his enemies, but as each one is consumed, 
His worry grows greater. What will happen when the last one is gone? Will the tiger then turn and eat him? Well, we are the UN's tiger. Societics came along just at the time it was sorely needed. Earth had settled a number of planets and governed them, first as outposts, then as colonies. The most advanced planets very quickly outgrew the colony stage and flexed their independent muscles. The UN had no particular desire to rule an empire, but at the same time they had to ensure Earth's safety. I imagine they were considering all sorts of schemes, including outright military control, when they came to me. Even in its early, crude form, Societics provided a stopgap that would give them some breathing time. They saw to it that my work was well endowed and aided me, unofficially of course, in setting up the first control experiments on different planets. We had results, some very good and the others not so bad that the local police couldn't get things back under control after a while. I was, of course, happy to perfect my theories and practice. After a hundred years I had all the rough spots even down and we were in business. The UN has never come up with a workable alternative plan, so they have settled down to the uncomfortable business of holding the tiger's tail. They worry and spend vast sums of money keeping an eye on our work. But why? Neil broke in. Why? Abravanel gave a quick smile. Thank you for fine character rating. I imagine it is inconceivable to you that I might want to be Emperor of the Universe. I could be, you know. The same forces that hold the lids on the planets could just as easily blow them off. Neil was speechless at the awful enormity of the thought. Abravanel rose from behind his desk with an effort and shambled over to lay a thin and feather-light arm on the younger man's shoulders. Those are the facts of life, my boy, and since we cannot escape them, we must live with them. Costa is just a man doing his duty. So try and put up with him, for my sake if not for your own. Of course, Neil agreed quickly. The whole thing takes a bit of getting used to, but I think I can manage. We'll do as good a job on Himmel as it is possible to do. Don't worry about me, sir. Costa was waiting in the next room, puffing quietly on a long cigarette. They left together, walking down the hall in silence. Neil glanced sideways at the wiry, dark-skinned Brazilian and wondered what he could say to smooth things out. He still had his reservations about Costa, but he'd keep them to himself now. Abravanel had ordered peace between them, and what the old man said was the law. It was Costa who spoke first. Can you brief me on Himmel, what we'll find there and be expected to do? Run the basic survey first, of course, Neil told him. Chances are that that will be enough to straighten things out. Since the completion last year of the refining equations of De Beers' postulate, all Sigma-110 and Alpha-142 graph points are suspect. Just stop there, please, and run the flag back down the pole," Costa interrupted. I had a six-month survey of Societics seven years ago to give me a general idea of the field. I've worked with survey teams since then, but I have only the vaguest idea of the application of the information we got. Could you cover the ground again, only a bit slower? Neil controlled his anger successfully and started again in his best classroom manner. Well, I'm sure you realize that a good survey is half the problem. It must be impartial and exact. If it is accurately done, application of the K-factor equations is almost mechanical. You've lost me again. Everyone always talks about the K-factor, but no one has ever explained just what it is. Neil was warming to his topic now. It's a term borrowed from nucleonics, and best understood in that context. Uh, look, you know how an atomic pile works, essentially just like an atomic bomb. The difference is just a matter of degree and control. In both of them you have neutrons tearing around, some of them hitting nuclei and starting new neutrons going. These in turn hit and start others. This goes faster and faster and bam, a few milliseconds later, you have an atomic bomb. This is what happens if you don't attempt to control the reaction. However, if you have something like heavy water or graphite that will slow down neutrons, 
and an absorber like cadmium, you can alter the speed of the reaction. Too much damping material will absorb too many neutrons, and the reaction will stop. Not enough, and the reaction will build up to an explosion. Neither of these extremes is wanted in an atomic pile. What is needed is a happy balance, where you are soaking up just as many neutrons as are being generated all the time. This will give you a constant temperature inside the reactor. The net neutron reproduction constant is then 1. This balance of neutron generation and absorption is the K factor of the reactor. Ideally, 1.000000. End of section 1.